Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Brendan Cole. Pakistan's polio eradication campaign, which had been halted, has restarted on Tuesday. On the first day of the two-day campaign, those under the age of five were vaccinated in a national drive to vaccinate more than 2.5 million children. The health workers administering the vaccine were provided with high-level security. That was because the campaign was stopped last week after six women and one man working for a health and education charity were killed in a drive-by shooting after they had left a community centre in the northwest of the country. The seemingly coordinated attacks raised fears for the safety of inoculators and highlighted resistance to the campaign by the Taliban. However, no group has claimed responsibility yet for the attacks, but most suspicion focused on the Pakistani Taliban, which had previously blocked polio vaccinators and complained that the United States is using the programme as a cover for espionage. Insurgents have long been suspicious of polio vaccinators, seeing them as potential spies. In 2010, the CIA set up a phony vaccination drive in Abbottabad, whose main goal was to get DNA samples from the community to track down Osama bin Laden. In North Waziristan, one prominent warlord has banned polio vaccinations until the United States ceased drone strikes in the area. Pakistan is one of three countries left tackling the disease. But has the CIA vaccination campaign damaged the fight against polio? How tied up? Is it with Pakistan's war on terror and the Taliban? Well, to discuss this and issues surrounding it, I'm joined by Gareth Price, who's a senior research fellow in the Asia programme at the Chatham House Think Tank in London. Heidi Larson, who is a senior lecturer at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She leads a team studying issues around public trust in vaccines and the implications for immunisation programmes and policies. On the line, we have Dr. Abdul Majid Katme, who's a broadcaster and who has worked in the National Health Service for over 15 years and is calling for a debate among Muslims about vaccinations. And from Islamabad, on the line, we have Zinia Sati, who's a newspaper columnist and security analyst. A warm welcome to you all here on The Voice of Russia. Heidi Larson, what are the consequences of stopping a polio vaccination program that we saw last week when it was in full flight? Well, I think that it was important to at least temporarily stop it. I think that if if it's a temporary stoppage, the polio program can go on. But I think that when it's sustained stopping, it can have a problem. We had a decade ago uh, the issue in northern Nigeria when a number of states boycotted the polio vaccination for 11 months, and that led to a respread of polio to 20 previously polio-free countries. So there are there can be. Uh, serious consequences depending on how long the program has stopped. So, I mean, we know the virus is highly contagious, but how much progress was being made in the polio endemic areas in Pakistan before the stoppage? Well, before the stoppage, polio in Pakistan, the program had actually done quite well in 20, 2012. 2011 was n- not a very good year. They had had a, an increase in the number of cases, but did a, a very good job in bringing the numbers down in 2012. So it would really be a shame to lose that progress. Um, Zinia Sati, I'll, I'll turn to you. Do you think it was strange that there was no admission of responsibility over the killings, the most recent killings last week? Well, um, yes. I mean, normally there is an admission from the Taliban after they have killed or um, after a prominent uh, person on the Western side has been killed, and this time it didn't happen. I do find that strange because it's not in keeping with the pattern. We always hear the responsible, um, a phone call comes and somebody says, you know, the spokesperson for the Taliban is taking responsibility for the killing. If we compare it to, say, the, the shooting of Malala Yousafzai, who was shot by the Taliban in October, there was an admission straight away. We didn't see one here. I mean, can we be categorically sure that this was the Taliban was behind this? Well, you know, I mean, who else could do it? They are the organized force battling the other side of this battle. And the United States of America has actually uh, very irresponsibly come out in the open and declared to all and sundry their method of catching bin Laden. They didn't have to do that. (laughs) You're actually telling the world that we are deploying polio vaccination for babies, immunization of babies as a weapon in this war. When you do that, the other side is obviously going to fight that weapon. Nobody coming forward to take responsibility for this could be two things. One, the Taliban realized that this is going a bit far. Already Malala has damaged their cause a lot. I mean, there was, there was, there was absolutely nobody in Pakistan, uh, in this metropolis, or in the rest of the world, which <laughs> thought 
that this was a brave act of war. I mean, this was cowardly, an attack on a 15-year-old. It could be that they are conscious, that's number one. Number two is, it could be that they didn't do it, actually. Uh, there's a lot going on in this region, and a lot of the covert activities related to this war, you know, people are trying to pin the blame on, on each other. We don't really know who does what. It's possible that it was done by somebody else who wants to uh, whip up public opinion against the Taliban, so a military operation can be done in North Waziristan. Heidi Larson, I'll bring in you again, accepting Taliban involvement. You wrote in May in The Guardian that the plot against bin Laden had a direct causal link to attacks on polio workers. Do you see a kind of causal link here in last week's, uh, or, is it a lot more, or is it a lot more complex than that? Well, I think that the CIA choice of, it was actually hepatitis B vaccine in the, in the household um, that they used to try to get... Of DNA. course, it was a hepatitis B vaccination program, not a polio vaccination yeah. program. But you don't do house-to-house -house vaccination with hepatitis B vaccine, so I think that it did create confusion because the only house-to-house -house vaccination effort was with polio, so I think it was an easy thing to, to misappropriate. But I think that basically the CIA choice was one of multiple factors that have weighed into both the previous killings and one. I, I wouldn't single it out any more than I would single out the issues and views about women working, women being educated, and the other things going on in the country, as Zina has rightly said. There's a lot going on right now. Um, I think it is one of multiple contributors to an unstable environment and concerns that are going on right now. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. We're discussing polio vaccinations in Pakistan with Gareth Price, Heidi Larson, Dr. Abdul Majid Khatme, and Zinia Sati. Dr. Abdul Majid Khatme, I suppose we're talking about Islamic extremists here in terms of the killings of these uh, health workers, but are there any Islamic objections to vaccinations um, in general? Yeah, well, before coming to that, if you allow me, I, as a Muslim and Muslim all over the world, do condemn, no doubt, the killing of any health worker or anybody generally, an innocent human being. And we just heard before there is no clear evidence or admission by Taliban or anybody. I don't know what's behind it. But the other point really, I think United States and CIA spy and all that, they played with fire. And this is a big blow to the whole vaccine industry and to the feeling of the Muslim uh, lack of trust regarding vaccine generally. Now, coming back to my interest for the last five, ten years, I'm raising the alarm and asking people to have a proper scientific and religious debate regarding vaccine. If you allow me, the first point, when I done my research two years ago, published in the International Council, uh, Medical Council on Vaccination in the United States, I was horrified and I was surprised as a medical doctor. How did I miss that? all this year. Our children, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, especially Muslim children, they're having about 10 to 15 forbidden haram ingredients in vaccine from uh, a lot of pus, heavy, uh, fetal cell, urine, formaldehyde, mercury. I'm uh, mentioning this chemical because toxic, neurotoxic we discover, and gelatin, pork, it's unbelievable. It's forbidden in our religion to introduce in our human body inside anything contradict. We cannot eat it during our life. We cannot consume it. So this, to me, was the biggest cover-up by the giant pharma industry. We are six, 1,600 million Muslims. I don't believe hundreds of these 1,600 million Muslims, they know about all this haram forbidden ingredients. But the, forgive me for interrupting, but, the, but, the, but the, haram, the haram ingredients, we, we, I mean, we're talking about, there has been opposition in, uh, in Muslim areas, say, for instance, in Nigeria in 2003, but there wasn't any kind of Quranic reason for those um, objections. There were, there were accusations that the vaccine would sterilize children and could be seen as a conspiracy theory, but there was no Quranic reason. You say no Quran. We have a lot of Quranic reason forbidden to you to eat pork, to have pork inside your body. So what, some vaccines contain gelatin from pork. It's forbidden for us to have fetal cell, a human part in our body. It's well-known fact. But the biggest problem I'm discovering, all Muslim scholars, ulama, theologians, they are not aware of the many, many 
forbidden ingredient. And that if they give any fatwa, superficial knowledge they have got, unfortunately. They are not aware of the damaging, neurotoxic damage coming from mercury, aluminum, and formaldehyde, which coming in hundreds and thousands of studies. I'm involved, not me, myself, with Muslim in America, Muslim in Britain, but more with so- ten of thousands and millions of non-Muslim scientists and doctors. Can I, bring in, can I go back to Heidi Larson now from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine? I mean, what do you make of that point of view? I think that there's a lot of different views out in the debates right now. From my research and the research going on globally, and particularly around the issue about mercury and aluminum, there's been an abundance of research investigating those suspected links, particularly now because next week in Geneva there are going to be governments around the world coming together to look at products, what medical products, what products in the environment uh, will go into a global uh, mercury treaty. And the Marisol has been on the list of those potential things, and it has unilaterally been excluded. I mean, the science is saying there's no link. The debates, uh, the treaty is not finalized. But I would be cautious about the assumption about the links with mercury, aluminum, and formaldehyde. I do take the point about the pork-related gelatin around the oral polio vaccine. I worked with UNICEF for, for many years, and we did address that. There has There is now an alternative coding for the oral polio vaccine. There has been a solution to that particular aspect, and I, I take that point. Uh, Zinia Santi, uh, we saw the Pakistani Prime Minister, Raja Pervez Ashraf, condemn the killings. Shouldn't the Pakistani government have done something to curb fears over the polio program? I mean, this wasn't necessarily an international initiative. It was as much a Pakistani one, wasn't it? Oh, yes, certainly. I mean, it is a Pakistani issue right now, you know. I mean, we will divorce it from the international scene locally. It's a very big issue. The Pakistani government is in a bind, you know. They are in a very strange relationship with the Western forces. It's called alliance in the war on terror, but at the same time, the NATO forces can come across, cross the border, and kill Pakistani military officers, you know, a huge number of them, not one or two, but... There has been 11 and then more than that. Then the way Osama bin Laden was, was caught, and after he was caught, I mean, Pakistan did not see the body. The CIA declared, I mean, it, it sort of, you know, told everyone how we caught him. We used polio vaccination as a cover. Then um, in the um, presidential debate, recent one between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, Barack Obama was saying over and over again that had they informed Pakistani military, that they are going to carry out an operation to catch bin Laden. They would not have been able to catch him. So, you know, you don't treat your allies like that. But at the same time, obviously Pakistan is not in a position to take on the United States of America or the NATO forces in a confrontational manner. But although the main... But but it would be fair to say the religious political parties support polio vaccination in Pakistan, don't they? But they never seem to condemn atrocities. It's all part of perception building, which uh, maybe the Pakistan government feel that they can't necessarily, if they come out in support of the polio uh, vaccination program too strongly, they'll be seen as, as Western stooges, perhaps. Well, they have come out in support of the polio vaccination. You know, lock, stock and barrel. There has been absolutely no hesitation on, on, on that point. But within this complex relationship in which the other side says the Americans are playing dirty here and therefore we have a right to safeguard our children against that kind of machination, the Pakistan government cannot say, no, they are not playing dirty here. Because you don't know what the Americans are going to do next after somebody who is a high government official in Pakistan has categorically stated, no, they are not going to play it dirty, not when it comes to vaccinating the little babies of the area. You never know what CIA is going to pull next. They, they behave like a bull in China shop in this matter. You see, there is complete disregard to the problems that the local communities are faced with in the area on the health front. You know, their focus is entirely on the political and the military front, so they don't think of this, and there is a fallout, of course. With regard to the political fallout, can I just bring in Gareth Price from the Chatham House think tank? But do you see this as a kind of, uh, I don't know, a statement against imperialism and perhaps the CIA program the, um, uh, which led to the capture of Osama bin Laden was seen as an imperialist threat, and this is more about countering that. I mean, I think what's quite interesting is how the centre of debate in Pakistan has shifted over the last few years. A few years ago, when in another polio immunization drive, the head of the World Health Organization in Pakistan was killed. Whilst this time the government, yes, it has come out and said it supports the polio vaccination drive, 
a few years ago, after the head of the World Health Organization in Pakistan was killed, I would say that the reaction in Pakistan was much more, there was a much greater reaction. And in that case, as I recall, the head of the Jamaat Islamia issued a fatwa saying that polio vaccination should continue in Pakistan. And that sort of quelled that. Now, that was when the claims were that the polio vaccination drive, as in Nigeria, was to sterilize Muslims. Clearly, the CIA strategy in Abbottabad doesn't help, but it strikes me that the problem was there predating that, and it's something of a kind of canard, if you like, to say that it's the CIA should almost take responsibility for what's happening now. Yeah, I have, seen, I have read the Quran backwards and forwards. There is nothing in the Quran that tells the Muslims not to vaccinate themselves. There is nothing against vaccination or preemptive strike against any kind of disease. Yes, it tells you not to eat pork. You know, that is clearly stated because it's unhealthy, the meat, that's what it says. So um, there is no religious reason against it. What is happening right now is it's political phenomena, and they, you know, the, the health drive and the, the campaign to eradicate polio has been caught up in that political phenomena, which is, and it's a complex one, and it's very annoying for those who would like to see children vaccinated and who would like to eradicate polio from this part of the world. Okay, but back to you, Gareth Price. Is it more broadly an issue of Taliban objections to women going from door to door, giving out vaccinations, women in, public, in the public sphere, in the public spaces, and plus women who are receiving wages for work. Isn't, it's more of a religious issue then, in that sense. The, there is the Pakistan Taliban in conflict with the Pakistan government and its military. And then you have sim, a, a range of sort of symbolic issues, if you like. And it would seem to me that immunisation is one, girls' education would be another one, the blasphemy law would be another one. And where that sort of fits with Pakistan public opinion, it varies. So when the governor of Punjab was killed a couple of years ago, public opinion didn't come out in, you know, against his murder. Public opinion seemed to be quiet. When you have Malala Yousafzai, which you raised earlier, clearly public opinion there is very much supportive of girls' education. In relation to immunisation, it would seem to me that public opinion or at least vociferous public opinion, puts that towards the kind of the blasphemy law end rather than the girls' education end of the spectrum. So these are kind of symbolic issues which the Taliban, you know, and as you say, fits in with very much the role of women in society. I don't know how, how much people are aware. I came across a study recently. Breastfeeding has got antibody against poliomyelitis. Breastfeeding is an order in the Holy Book of the Quran. I'm using this new scientific discovery to remind people there are other way alternative to build natural immune dis- system. We need to feed the people natural healthy diet. We need ha- a safe drinking water. We need uh, sanitation. And when the body develops natural immune system, and to go back to our religious instruction to breastfeed up to two years as the World Health Organization has been saying for the last few years, as mentioned in the Quran. The second point, this vaccine is going to issue will be more distrust, mistrust in the Muslim world, a thing going on. I feel the only short way, important way for Muslim country to manufacture, to produce their own halal, safe vaccine. Otherwise, it's going to be very messy business, and there will be a lot of people suffering, and I don't know if there will be more killing by some fanatic. Heidi Larson, I mean, he's referring to mistrust, perhaps. Obviously, there's mistrust from the Taliban side, but um, not not necessarily amongst the general population, is there, uh, against a polio vaccination program? No. In fact, I think that that's one of the dichotomies, as it were. I mean, UNICEF has done a lot of house-to-house surveys to try to understand reasons for refusal, and it's generally accepting. There are pockets of refusals, but some of that is because of fears of local leaders Im- imposing that. There is this, and I think Zinia said it well, that this is polio in general, and the program has general support, but it's been caught up in larger political issues and debates. Just on Dr. Kudme's point, one of the ways that some of the issues were resolved around the boycott in Nigeria were explicitly to change the provider to vaccines produced in Indonesia, another Muslim country, and that was one of the strategies that helped uh, alleviate the issues about trust. Uh, we have with one Nigeria. vaccine produced in Malaysia for pilgrim 
meningitis and halal. So this was one way forward to assure the Muslim public at large and to make them relax. Obviously, the other issue of mercury and lead and formaldehyde aluminium still need to be solved out. I know some speaker, educated people, talk before me about, you know, uh, I'm proving, but we have proving thousands, not, hun- not hundred thousand, of scientific medical evidence about the harm of this chemical and damage to the brain and nervous system. So the way forward for Muslim to look, this is what I've been shouting for 10 years, let's have a, a proper intelligent debate scientifically, medically, and religiously. Zinia Sati in Islamabad, anger in Pakistan, I suppose, against the West, in particular against the US, as a result of drone strikes in particular, but also, you know, you could you could um, uh, shoehorn the polio vaccination program as being a part of that. Do you, do you think that, that um, the, the killings last week are a symptom of instability um, in that part of Pakistan, and that's not being taken account of by the uh, Western governments? Yes, of course, of course. I mean, you know, any killing in that part of the world is, is a symptom of the instability that's there. Uh, the drone strikes, as you very rightly mentioned, have killed a lot of civilians. You know, I'm sitting here in Pakistan, and the arguments um, coming from uh, KP and FATA against polio, polio vaccination that has common currency here, that I hear, is actually, it has nothing to do with whether the vaccination is halal or haram or they are toxic. I hear matters related to espionage. I hear the fears that the United States of America is trying to maim the entire generation of the Pashtuns because they want to kill them all, they want to get rid of the population and take over their resources and the land, and they have no sympathy for the people who live there, and that is why they've been here for the last 11 years, but they have done absolutely nothing to uplift the social and the economic profile of, of the people that they are administering. All they're doing is killing. This is what I hear. But, so, but, but in that case, time. then, shouldn't, shouldn't the Pakistani government be focused on, on, on seeing the attacks on health workers as, as part of the fight against the Taliban? Well, they have come forward to say that these attacks must be stopped, that they are not going to tolerate that. But their capacity to stop these things is very limited because they have ceded operability in that area to the NATO forces, mainly the American forces, the Pentagon, through drone strikes. So when you say, I am going to counter this myself, and you do not have the complete authority and the complete freedom to do as you wish, then anything you say is not going to be taken serious on either side. And sure, the Americans are not taking it serious, you know, they're saying, oh, they're not coming uh, forward, you know, clamping down on this enough, and the Taliban are not taking uh, the Pakistani government serious, and uh, within Pakistan in other parts, people are wondering what's going on, and they are trying to actually extricate control themselves, and Tahir al-Qadri's movement is very much about that. I mean, you'll see more of it as, as you know, the days go on. I think it's going to be all about giving Pakistan back the control over its territory and stopping the drone strike. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Brendan Cole. We're discussing the killing of polio vaccination workers in Pakistan. With me is Gareth Price, Senior Research Fellow on the Asia Programme at Chatham House. Heidi Larson, a Senior Lecturer at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. On the line we have Dr Abdul Majid Katme, a broadcaster who's calling for a debate among Muslims about vaccinations. And from Islamabad, we have Zinia Sati, a newspaper columnist and security analyst. Um, regarding the drone strikes, Gareth Price, a senior Taliban commander, Mullah Nazir, killed in South Waziristan last week. Stability in the region, it's, gone, it's on a downhill, down, downward slope, isn't it? Uh, how do we rate how the West and the Pakistani government are tackling the Taliban in that um, rest of region? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, you have a divergence between the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistan Taliban. And Pakistan at the moment does seem to be pushing for talks in engaging with the Taliban in relation to the Taliban in Afghanistan, which is clearly positive. I mean, I think what's quite interesting is that because as the Afghan Taliban hopes that it's getting closer to power, you actually see not in relation to vaccinations, but in terms of in relation to girls' education and so forth, suddenly, rhetorically at least, they're making much more positive statements. Whether that would actually be carried out in practice, you know, who knows? Whereas the Pakistan Taliban seems much more, if you like, nihilistic because it's nowhere near near gaining power. Again, I mean, in terms of the regional situation, a few months ago you did see positive steps between India and Pakistan. That, that seemed to be going somewhere. So at that sort of international level, there are positive signs. Then add to that a couple of days ago there was firing on the border between India and Pakistan and Kashmir. 
But Pakistan will continue releasing Taliban leaders, won't it, to kind of um, pave the way to some kind of negotiations with the Afghan government, and that will continue, won't it? I mean, they're still pretty optimistic. Yeah, I mean, I think freeing the Taliban prisoners, that's a symbolic thing to say that they are ready to engage and ready to allow the Taliban to be involved in, in peace negotiations. And that's a positive thing. I mean, it's taken a very long time. But on that level, there are positive signs. At the same time, you have this gnawing away at Pakistan society by Pakistan Taliban. And, and just the general sort of centre of debate within Pakistan, that shifting towards sort of an Islamist rather than a sort of liberal, if I can sort of make up that spectrum. Also, we're, t- we're talking about the polio vaccination program, but there's also a considerable measles vaccination program in Pakistan. What are your expectations for that, Heidi Larson? Well, I think the the main expectation is that there needs to be really a boosting of the measles immunization program, which indeed they they are making that effort. There have been really a severe spike in measles uh, disease and death uh, that is of great concern. I think that the issue of the measles immunization is less of a political football than uh, polio. It is much more locally owned and and run. So I think the, the prospects are better. Although having said that, the lady health workers have also boycotted some of the measles uh, vaccination, but that's more of an issue of adequate wages and being supported. I think there is uh, an inevitable sense of insecurity. Senior Sati, do you see perhaps polio in Pakistan going the way of smallpox and being completely eradicated in Pakistan? I hope so. Do I see it under the current circumstances? Of course not. Uh, there are uh, obstacles to uh, this sort of achievement. I hope that these obstacles will be removed. I hope that there will be a strategy, the Ministry of Health, uh, along with the Pakistan military and the Taliban and the local influentials of the area, mainly the mothers, you know, the, the mothers inside the area would, would sort of come together and, and form a kind of movement to ensure that their children are healthy and the polio is eradicated. It can be done through collaborative effort. It can also um, be done if the United States of America comes uh, forward in some sort of real way and apologizes for the way the bin Laden affair was handled and does something positive on the health front for the people of the area. Majid, Majid Kadmi, are you optimistic about the measles vaccination program, no, for instance, in Pakistan? I'm not optimistic about all Western manufacture vaccine generally. But let me say one general point. The moment America sit down and get out of any Muslim country, by all means and way, and not interfere, this is a day where we can have some peace, health, and produce, God willing, our own halal, safe vaccine. Gareth Price, um, in terms of stability, both sides of the Durant line, do you see the issue of vaccinations as much of a hot potato as, for instance, drone attacks? Do you think that they could they could merge into some kind of uh, general antipathy towards um, Western policy in the region? I think what they highlight, is, as, as we've heard from the speakers in Pakistan, is the extent of distrust at the moment, and that's something that's going to take a very long time to, to build up. If something desirable as preventing measles or polio or whatever can become this political issue, then, you know, there's a problem. I'd just like to finish by thanking my guest Gareth Price, Senior Research Fellow on the Asia Programme at Chatham House, Heidi Larson, a Senior Lecturer at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. On the line, Dr Abdul Majid Katme, a broadcaster, and from Islamabad, Zina Sati, a newspaper columnist and security analyst. Thank you very much for joining me, Brendan Cole.